Republic of Ireland, Government, Unitary Parliamentary Republic, Ruler, Amon de Valera, Area, 27,000 square miles, Population, 3 million, Military personnel, 40,000 men, with a reserve force of 105,000, Navy, 6 more torpedo boats, and 4 other craft. From the Act of Union of 1800 until December of 1922, the island of Ireland was part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. During the Great Famine in the mid-1840s, the Irish island population of over 8 million fell by nearly one-third. One million Irish died of starvation and disease, and another 1.5 million emigrated, mostly to the United States. This is why during the American Civil War, you saw many Irish units fighting for both sides, as they would generally be immediately thrust into the army after coming off the boat. This set the power of emigration for the century to come, resulting in a constant population decline up to the 1960s. The Local Government Act of 1898 gave Ireland the same sort of local government c control that existed within the remainder of the UK. This act encompassed the whole Isle of Ireland, even though the Unionist movement had been on popular rise since the first Home Bill was issued in 1886. A third Home Bill was to be done in 1914, but the war put that on hold. On Easter Sunday 1916, an uprising occurred that attempted to break Ireland fear from British control. It didn't gain massive support, but the execution of the leaders of the uprising, as well as the conscription crisis in 1918, swayed public opinion towards independence. A war of independence and civil war occurred shortly after, but that will be discussed at a later time. Tensions between the newly independent Irish state and the UK remained high during the interwar period. On taking over power and coming into office in 1932, the new Finan government under Imon de Valera enacted a protectionist policy with the economy, and tariffs were introduced for a wide range of imported goods, mainly from Britain. This was thought necessary to develop native industry and move away from over-dependence on Britain, while at the same time allowing Irish industry to be able to catch up on the free market. It was also to compensate for the drastic fall in demand for Irish agricultural products on international markets following the start of the Great Depression. A vigorous campaign was set in motion to make the free state agriculturally and industrially self-sufficient by Minister of Industry and Commerce Cien Limas. Every effort was taken to add to the measures brought in by the previous government to boost tillage farming and industry and to encourage the population to avoid British imports and buy Irish goods. The government sought to go further and end the repayment to Britain of land and amenities. These originated from the government loans granted to Irish farmers by the Land Commission from the 1880s, which had enabled farmers to purchase lands from their former landlords. The previous government had agreed that Ireland would continue to pay these debts every year to the UK. Two years after that agreement was made, another one exempt the free state from the public debt in the UK, and this is where the disagreement came from. Valerie pitted that the land and natives were part of the public debt, and no longer the responsibility of his government to pay. He also issued a series of claims against the British for over £450 million in regards to back payment that Ireland was owed since the 1800s. Negotiations broke down in late 1932, and the British responded by imposing a 20% tariff on, on Irish products, which a large amount of the British public were willing, unwilling to pay for. The Irish responded by imposing a similar tariff on coal. This caused significant hardship within the free state, as exports to Britain encompassed nearly 90% of their exports. This only further worsened the economic situations of the free state, and within three years, action was taken by the Cattle Coal Pact, where Britain started to buy cattle in exchange for coal, reducing the overall tariffs on both of them. The resolution of the crisis came after a series of talk in London between the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and de Valera. An agreement to reach an acceptable settlement was drawn in 1938, enacted in Britain and the IRA Act. Under the terms of the three-year Anglo-Irish Trade Treaty, all duties imposed during the previous five years were lifted. Although the period of the economic war resulted in severe social suffering and heavy financial loss for Ireland, its outcome was publicized as favorable. Ireland was still entitled to impose tariffs on British imports to protect new Irish industries. It also included the return to Ireland of the treaty ports, which had been obtained by Britain under a provision of the 1921 treaty. When war was declared in late 1939, the Irish government quickly reclaimed their neutrality, attempting to get guarantees from the German ambassador that the embassy wouldn't be used for attacks against Ireland. A guarantee was also established within the British Domains Commissioner Anthony Eden, who was a staunch defender of Irish neutrality in Parliament. 
Even still, there was a reluctance on the part of the British to accept the policy of Irish neutrality. After the German invasion of Norway in April of 1940, Winston Churchill became the British Prime Minister. The fall of France in June of the same year brought the war close to Ireland, as German troops occupied the French coastline across the Celtic Sea. The UK was now the only major impediment to Germany for a little more than a year. A major British concern now was whether Germany would invade Ireland. The British view was that the Irish army was not powerful enough to resist an invasion for long enough for reinforcements from the UK, particularly with the IRA as a potential liability, and we should be able to prevent this by stationing troops and ships within the island. The UK had just relinquished control of three main ports called the Treaty Ports back to Ireland three years prior. These are the ports of Long Twilly in the north, Bear Haven, and Spike Island in the south. The return of these ports actually made Ireland neutral, as otherwise having the British Navy within your ports kind of made to where you had to side with them. After the fall of France, a British ambassador arrived to try to persuade Ireland to join the Allies. The terms were pretty simple. Join the Allies and you get Northern Ireland. Valois refused this proposal as he more than likely guessed that creating a fully unified Ireland wasn't guaranteed. Ireland did have some very useful information to the Allies throughout the war, however, and over 15,000 Irishmen volunteered into British units. A large number of these were branded as traitors and deserters when they got home, since some of them left the army to join the Allies. The fascist elements in Ireland all but vanished within the first year of the war, and by 1943 the IRA barely existed. The nation did get attacked during the first two years of the war, though. German bombers launched a dozen attacks against various cities. On January the 1st and 2nd of 1941, Germany dropped bombs on Meath, Carlo, Kilbert, Willock, Wexford, and Dublin, resulting in 5 deaths and 70 wounded. The most fatal attack was on May the 31st of that year, where bombs were dropped in North Stradden, Dublin, killing 28 people and wounding another 90. Local anti-air defenses were rather weak, and the gunners poorly trained. The reason for the bombing isn't 100% known. Some have suggested it was in response to the aid given to the city of Belfast, Northern Ireland, and served as a warning to stay out of the war. Plans were drawn up by both Germany and the UK to invade and occupy Ireland. The German one was called Operation Grun, and it was originally intended to act as a way to the back door of Britain. This operation is different than the one of Plan Kathleen, which was a plan drawn up by Irish Republican Army Chief of Staff Sean Russell. Russell had started a bombing campaign in Britain and went to Berlin to get arms and support for the IRA. He was killed while coming back in a sub during Operation Dove. Russell had announced that if Germany were to invade England, his army would take over Ireland quickly, then aid in their own invasion. Grun didn't envision much if any help from the IRA, and pretty much left the soldiers and commandos on the ground to their own devices. As you can imagine, the British Plan W was much more reasonable to happen since Germany would have invaded Ireland as a feint and to do so in combination with Sea Lion. Valerie didn't have any intention to fight against the British if they chose to invade. He understood that Ireland didn't have the capacity to fight the larger neighbor toe-to-toe -to -toe, and that German help would be minimal.